Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Melanie Keller here today. Melanie completed her PhD two weeks ago, so it's very exciting. <laughs> um, she's been looking a lot at user behavior on the web in the context of particular tasks that people are working on. She also um, will be presenting some of her work at CHI in a couple of weeks and received a nomination for a Best Paper Award for some of the, the work that you'll see today. Thank you. Um, so, like Chris said, today I'm going to be sort of giving you an overview of uh, the research that I did as part of my PhD. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the motivation, the motivation behind this research, and I'm going to present the three studies that form the core of my PhD thesis, and talk a little bit about some future directions for this work. So when I first started my PhD research, um, I was actually a little bit more in the information retrieval side of things. And I was looking at recommender systems. So systems that select items um, of interest for users based on their in previous interests or interests of similar users. And how you actually find out about people's interests can either be done explicitly. So asking people, um, is this document relevant? Was it interesting? Or you can do it implicitly by observing you know, how they interact with documents. So when we started looking at this, we found that um, there was some research, and some of the research we did found that the type of task that someone is engaging in may impact the effectiveness of implicit measures, which led us to say, OK, well, if you know, task is a factor, what are the types of tasks people are doing on the web? And what we actually found is that there's really a lack of research um, looking at the high-level tasks that people do on the web and not only that, but how people interact with their web browsers in the context of task. So for instance, in the HCI literature, there's been a lot of research looking at um, reporting usage. Um, and um, so for instance, revisitation. So how often people revisit websites, what percentage of people's web usage is revisitation. Um, and for instance, you know, how, many, how much of someone's navigation is due to the back button and clicked links. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of research looking at these types of behaviors in the context of task. So for instance, if I'm re revisiting a web page, um, is it because I'm monitoring information on the web page? Or is it simply because I'm refining information? Is it the continuation of another task? And how does the type of support differ based on these underlying um, tasks and behaviors? So when we started looking at the types of tasks that people do on the web, um, we looked at both the information science and HCI literature. And we found that there, for the most part, seems to be three common um, task types that everyone seems to agree on. So the first is fact-finding or informal search. So this is when you're looking for something very specific on the web. It could be textual, um, it could be an image. Usually you know what you're looking for and you can identify it when you see it. The second category is formal search or information gathering, um, which is very much, there's been a lot of research done on, um, on this type of task in the information science literature. So gathering information, collecting information to do research, to write a report, to make a decision. And the third one is browsing or condition viewing. So this is sort of your classic notion of web browsing, which often um, has no particular goal in mind, can be serendipitous. And other um, tasks that have been identified, so is condition viewing or monitoring. So returning to a website to look for updated information or new information, as well as categories such as transacting, communicating, and housekeeping. Um, so Bystrom and Handsome state that the uh, concept of task is an important area of study for two reasons. So first of all, because it's important in gaining an understanding of why people seek information, the type of information they seek, the methods they choose to acquire it, and the use they make of it. And second of all, um, because it provides a framework for analyzing and developing information access. And certainly much of the research that I just presented on the last slide has been used in a lot of ways as a framework um, or as a basis for understanding different types of um, user behavior on the web. So the first study that we conducted was a field study to explore information-seeking tasks on the web, um, where the goals were, first of all, to try and develop a high-level classification of web information tasks, so building on the previous research and also updating it, where much of it had been conducted in the late 90s or early 2000s. We are also interested in understanding how users interact with their web browsers across different web-based tasks. So some of the data that we wanted to collect, um, so we wanted to collect all the URLs visited 
And we also wanted to collect web browser interactions, so how people actually interacted with the interface of the web browser. So how did they navigate? Were they using bookmarks or the back button? Um, were they creating bookmarks? Were they copy and pasting on the page? And we also wanted to collect task information, so a task categorization and a task description. So once we started this, when we started looking into data collection methods, we found that some things are really easy to collect. So tracking people's URLs on the web is really easy. Um, but how do you actually collect task information you know, in a field study over the course of a week without um, impacting the user's natural behavior too much? And how do you collect fine-grained web browser interactions? So how do you collect things like the back button? What sort of tools are available for that? And what we ended up doing was building a custom web browser um, that was built to mimic Internet Explorer. So using the .NET framework, we were able to, which basically provides you the web browser window, um, and so we built the functionality around that, and we were able to log all of that, um, all of that functionality as well. And in order to collect task information, what we did is we implemented the task toolbar that you see up there, which allowed people, as, as they initiated a new task, they could type in a short textual description, and they could click on the categorization. Now that categorization came out of the previous literature. Um, we also had a pilot study and a focus group where we iterated a little bit on the categories um, that we presented to users. Now, for instance, um, we had sort of an autocomplete function in the task description so that for tasks that people did over and over again, they could quickly <coughs> enter them. And they only had to fill out this information when they initiated a new task type. Um, and also, we also had what we called the task diary, so if people wanted to at the end of the day, they could just annotate all their information then. But we found for the most part that people actually preferred to do it in real time as they were starting new tasks. So we had 21 participants who took part in our week-long study. Um, we recruited IE users naturally um, and laptop users because it facilitated the installation of the software and also meant we were hope that we were hoping we'd get a greater percentage of their web usage. If they were laptop users, we would capture their at-home and school or work usage. And they were university students from a variety of academic backgrounds, so we had computer science students, um, art students, science students, and they were all fairly experienced web users. So over the course of the week-long study, we recorded 1,192 task sessions where almost half were transactions. So transactions were typically online actions, and about 80% of the transactions were email in nature, so web-based um, web email. We didn't capture any client-side uh, client email. We had uh, about 20% were browsing, closely followed by fact-finding, information gathering, and we had a small number of tasks that were categorized as other. And these were typically tasks where people were maintaining information on a web page, so that they were updating their web page, or if they were a webmaster, some of that, something of that nature. Now, we were interested in how people's interactions with their web browser differed across task types. This is sort of an abstract representation of the differences of these behaviors across the different task types. So, for instance, information gathering tasks were the longest in duration. Um, they had the largest number of pages viewed. And we saw that, um, not surprisingly, that fact-finding and information gathering tasks were often search-based. So we saw heavy use of search engines, whether it was... Um, a large search engine or even a domain specific search engine on a particular web page. We observed that the queries within fact finding were a lot longer than during information gathering. And we hypothesized that's because people were a little bit more specific about the, what they were looking for, um, whereas the information gathering queries tend to be a little bit more vague and not quite so specific. And while information gathering and fact finding were search based in nature, browsing and transactions tended to be um, a lot of revisitation. So we saw repeated task descriptions um, occurring over and over during the study. And finally, information gathering tasks also had the largest number of browser functions. So these were when, when people were creating bookmarks, um, if they were copying and pasting on the page, and these types of interactions with the browser. So it was certainly the most complex task in terms of the user's interactions with the web browser. We were also interested in how people navigated um, to websites according, within different task types. So we looked at how people initiated new tasks and whether that differed across task type. So for the most part, um, typed in URLs were the most common way that people initiated new tasks. But we did see that there were differences depending on the underlying task type. So for instance, fact finding and information gathering, in those cases a lot of times people initiated a task by using the search toolbar. Whereas browsing and transactions, we often observe bookmarks, um, higher use of bookmarks within those tasks. Yes? Sorry, so does typed in your URL here include those URLs that take you to search engines? Yes. So if they typed in the URL in that case, they would have 
they would have been logged as just typed in typed in URL. Um, so the two tasks that were heavy in revisitation had a greater usage of, um, of, of bookmarks in those cases. Although I should add, we didn't see a whole lot of that for the most part, because um, we did include uh, a Google toolbar in the custom browser. And for the most part, people did tend to use that instead of typing in a URL. So based on the, um, the, the, the task descriptions that we collected, um, as well as the previous literature, we developed the web information classification, which is meant to um, provide a representation of the information goals and the information tasks of, uh, of the users, where the information goals are information seeking, where the, users, the goal is, of the user is to change their state of knowledge, information exchange, where the goal is to exchange information. Um, and we broke that category, which was the old transactions category, up into two, transactions and communications where transactions are typically online actions where you're exchanging information with an online provider. So for instance, um, an online purchase um, or banking or something like that. Whereas communications is typically email, making a post to your blog. So where your goal is to communicate some sort of information with other individuals um, on, via the web. And finally, information maintenance, which didn't account for a large percentage, but is also um, seemingly being an emerging um, task where people are maintaining information on, uh, on a web page. So it was important that we reflected on, um, on how the actual um, study impacted our participants' usage. I mean, part of the point of running the field study was to be able to collect somewhat natural user behavior on the web, but we do acknowledge that we gave them a new web browser, while albeit looked very much like Internet Explorer, wasn't exactly Internet Explorer. Um, and we also had them annotate their task information. So it really seemed um, that people said that having to annotate their task information did have more of an impact on their web usage. So I had some participants who said that, for instance, it impacted their task switching behavior. So one participant said, you know, in the morning, you Usually I read the comics and I read the news and then I read my email and then I come back to the news. And people sometimes, would, they would read all the news, read all the email, and then read all their comics so they didn't have to change their task descriptions in the toolbar. So that's one of the ways that um, the study methodology may have impacted people's natural behavior. Now, during the pilot study, um, we had initially included monitoring um, based on the previous research as one of our information-seeking tasks. But what we found is that it overlapped with multiple tasks. So, for instance, I had one participant who, um, you know, would say, "Well, I was fact-finding. Um, I was, you know, looking for something factual, but it's something I do, I do routinely. Um, I'm constantly looking for updates to that factual information. Or I was browsing, but again, it's a routine. It's something um, that I do constantly, and I'm looking for updated information." So we also observed, you know, by looking at the task descriptions collected during the study, that what we, uh, what we think are instances of browsing, are instances of monitoring within browsing, fact-finding, um, communications, and transactions. So we hypothesize that monitoring is actually an activity that occurs within different web information tasks and isn't necessarily an independent information-seeking task on its own. So to look at this a little further, um, we next conducted a study exploring web-based monitoring in the context of task, where we conducted semi-structured interviews. Um, first of all, to study the role of monitoring within the web information tasks that we identified in the previous study, as well as to get a better understanding of the characteristics of monitoring activities on the web. So we had semi-structured interviews with 40 participants, um, and we had four, four groups that we recruited from. So we had 10 technical students, 10 non-technical students, 10 technical office workers, and 10 non-technical office workers. And for the most part, the interviews were conducted um, in people's offices or in their labs, seated in front of their computers so they could show us how they went about their different monitoring activities and the pages that they visited. So for what we asked <clears throat> during the interviews was for people to describe three personal and three work-related monitoring activities, if they had that many, um, where they would describe their goal, the type of information they were monitoring, whether they needed to log in to capture that ga gather that information if they needed to search, the duration and the frequency of the activities, and also any sort of follow-up activities that resulted from, from the behaviors or from that, from that activity. So we had 173 reported monitoring activities that for the most part were very easily classified into task types, so according to the tasks identified in the previous study, which supports our initial hypothesis that monitoring is an activity that occurs across all task types. Um, so almost half of them were categorized as browsing, uh, followed by fact finding and then information gathering. We had transactions, communications, and uh, maintenance. We also had a small number of tasks that 
for the most part, weren't easily classifiable in any one category. They tended to sort of um, stretch across a couple, multiple different tasks. So those ones we just categorized as combinations. So in general, browsing monitoring activities were characterized by um, the monitoring of web pages in order to see what was new. So examples of this were um, visiting new sites, um, people's blogs. Um, whereas fact-finding monitoring was very different in this case, it was characterized by monitoring very specific pieces of information on the web. So monitoring um, a grade, a sports score, um, the current weather forecast. Information gathering monitoring was characterized by, by monitoring new content to support an ongoing research-based task. And not necessarily academic research, it could be just something going on in someone's life, if they were house hunting or job hunting. So they're continually monitoring um, updates to any of these sites to help them make a decision or, or, or make a, you know, typically a major decision in their life. Um, whereas transactions monitoring were characterized by the monitoring of web pages, either in anticipation of or following an online transaction, so if you had made an online purchase, for instance, um, tracking the shipment of when your package would ship and, the, and those types of, um, of activities. Whereas communications monitoring was characterized by monitoring pages um, for new and updated uh, communications, which in this study was typically email. And finally, maintenance monitoring was characterized by uh, monitoring web pages with the intent of maintaining information on the chain maintaining information on the page. So for instance, um, if you were responsible for maintaining a page and other people had access it, to it as well, um, if you knew they had updated, you, want, you may want to look at it to make sure they didn't make any mistakes or that the content was up to date. So when we looked at how, we, when we asked people how they navigated to the web pages that they were monitoring, we saw a very heavy use of bookmarks. Um, across all of the task types. And similar to our previous study, we also saw um, for instance, within the two search-based tasks, use of, uh, of search, search engines. So, oh, is it, is it? so based on these findings, um, we developed some design recommendations for how to support monitoring activities because people are monitoring very ty different types of activities which require different types of support. So for instance, browsing um, monitoring, it may be more useful to provide an awareness of the rate of change to a, web, to a web page. So in these cases, these are typically pages that update very frequently. So you don't want to be popping up notifications that these pages are, you know, are continually being updated. And it can also be difficult to anticipate what may be of interest to a user. Because while people may have particular topics that they follow, it may be really difficult to anticipate what, in fact, may be of interest to these users where there's not always a particular goal in mind other than to stay updated. Um, we found that the functionality could be provided through bookmarks, where we observed a heavy use of bookmarks, that this may be an appropriate way to deliver that information. Um, within fact-finding monitoring in these cases, people really only need to be notified when relevant factual information changes, and the notifications should also be discreet. So people are very concerned about um, privacy as well as screen real estate. So they don't want big notifications popping up, and they don't want to give up a lot of their web browser real estate to, to these types of tools. Um, within information gathering monitoring, um, it seemed that stored queries may be useful for where in a lot of cases people access the information using queries and that email may be an appropriate form of notification for these, um, for these activities because they don't occur all that frequently. So um, in that case, email may be appropriate where you're not interrupting people's tasks as much, um, where it's not something they engage in usually on a daily basis. In general, communications monitoring seemed to be fairly well supported. A lot of people used email um, notifications or pop-ups, and people seemed to be fairly happy with those. Well, transactions monitoring can be very difficult to, to support. So in a lot of cases, these were pages that people needed to log into to access the information. So there's a lot of security concerns in those cases. Um, and people, for, so airfare is actually one of the uh, monitoring activities that people said was one of their most complex activities. I had two participants who were um, in long distance relationships, so they were constantly monitoring airfare from a variety of different pages, and they, they said you know, that was certainly one of their most um, difficult and challenging monitoring activities. And finally, for maintenance monitoring, in these cases, part participants said that they really only needed to know that the page had changed and that it was very important that they were able to view the page just like all the other users were on the web, um, so that it looked just like it would look to everyone else. An interesting finding that also came out, is that, out of this is that for some people, monitoring information on the web was something that they themselves described as a compulsion or an addiction. Um, 
So five of the 40 participants you know, actually used the term addiction or compulsion. Um, and these were all students also who, uh, who, who, who said this. Now, two of the, um, the monitoring activities that were described as a compulsion were short-term fact-finding um, activities. So the study actually took, part, took place in March, where people were waiting for their grad school acceptances to come in. So I had, for instance, one participant who was waiting for his grad school um, Notification. So basically, the yes or no. Um, and I asked him how often he did this activity, and you know, he, he was very intense about this. And he said, you know, when I wake up, when I go to bed, um, after every class, before every class, I'm studying every 90 minutes. So this, you know, this was a very you know serious activity for him. Um, you know, but the good news is, is that once you know he gets that information, then this compulsive activity is you know going to stop, and he can move on with his life. Um, now we had three participants who described sort of long-term browsing activities. And these are the types of activities that really are a little bit more problematic because there's really no end in sight. Um, so for instance, one person said, you know, it's something like an addiction, so I have to do it or it feels like something's missing in my day. Um, someone else said it's an addiction, so probably like three times a day. It's also part of my nightly routine. Now while these don't really seem, you know, too, you know, I don't think it's overtaking their life, um, but to them they felt like it was an addiction, in some cases something that had to be mitigated. I had another participant who talked about how he was really trying to down on his news reading because he felt it was really having an impact on his um, his thesis progress. So the question is, you know, how can we help you know mitigate these types of behaviors while still allowing people to um, to monitor the information and to be you know stay in touch with uh, with the world. So. Based on the findings of the study, um, we updated the task categorization to include the notion of uh, monitoring, where monitoring is actually an activity that occurs to varying degrees across all task types. And we very roughly tried to estimate you know, how much um, monitoring occurs within each of those task types. So for instance, we hypothesized that there's a heavy amount of monitoring within browsing and communications, sort of a mid-level within fact-finding, and then lower levels within information gathering, transactions, and maintenance. So just some reflections on um, the methodology used in the study. Obviously, um, the interviewer can introduce bias when you're conducting interviews, so we used um, interview scripts to try and cut down on that. And there's also the problem with self-reports, especially when you're interviewing people you know, in their office. You know, it's great to be interviewing people in their offices because you get the context, but then you've got also the problem that you know, they may be worried about their colleagues overhearing. So for instance, I had one woman when I showed up, um, she showed me their internet policy that showed that they could only use the web for personal use um, you know, on breaks and, and lunchtime. So she didn't want me to think I was doing this um, during the day. And she also, you know, when she would describe it, she would say, you know, well, I, I check the news every day on my lunch break, you know, just to make sure that if anyone was listening, they certainly wouldn't think that, you know, she was doing this during work hours. Um, and that was more so for the, the office workers. And also, the percentage of monitoring activities may not really be representative of the absolute breakdown of monitoring on the web. So for instance, I think um, we only had about 10% of the monitoring activities were reported as communications. But I can guarantee you that almost all the participants you know, you know, monitored within their web browser, their email. They just chose not to report it, where we didn't really you know, press them to report activities if, if they didn't themselves. So the final study that we conducted was an evaluation of task-specific monitoring tools, where based on the recommendations that we developed um, as a result of the interviews, we developed three prototype monitoring tools to support fact-finding, maintenance, and browsing monitoring. So the first tool that we developed is called the, uh, the text clip tool. So what this does is it supports fact-finding monitoring that allows people to monitor factual pieces of information on the web. So in this case, um, you highlight the information of interest. So in this case would be the current bid of the eBay auction. And when the browser detects that that information has changed, you'll get a little notification. So you'll notice the little eBay um, icon down at the bottom of the screen that when the user clicks on it, gives them the updated information. Now the second tool that we developed was called Page Updated that we felt um, would be more useful for maintenance type tasks where people just need to, to know that the page had changed. So in this case, um, basically whenever the web browser detected that there had been any changes to this web page, you would get a, a small notification similar to the previous tool that alerted you to that any, something on the page had changed. Um, and for the purpose of our study to maintain consistency, we just had a little pop-up um, that in this case said Page Updated. And the final tool that we developed was the Enhanced Bookmarks tool to support browsing monitoring. So we wanted to sort of capitalize on the heavy use of bookmarks within browsing, um, browsing monitoring activities, where instead of you know, alerting people that the page has changed, we're giving them aware an awareness of how much the page has changed since their previous visit. So in this case, um, 
And what the bars represent is meant to sort of be just a very rough estimation of how much of the actual content on the page has changed since the user's previous visit. So we conducted a lab evaluation of these tools um, to determine, first of all, if the functionality is appropriate for the type of monitoring activities that people were engaging in, and second of all, to identify improvements to the utility and usability of the tools. So one of the questions that we sort of ran into is how do you actually study monitoring um, in the lab? You can't really impose a monitoring task on people, but uh, we, wanted to monitor, we wanted to simulate an environment um, where people are you know, multitasking and monitoring is one of the activities that they're engaging in. So we used a primary and secondary task scenario where their primary task was to write a review um, of, a, of a game that they, you know, a new video game, of a restaurant, of a movie, anything that they'd like. And we also asked them to, um, to engage in these, mon we gave them um, monitoring tasks and asked them to use the um, the tools that we gave them to help them monitor that information. So much of the actual monitoring tool was, was instrumented, so it wasn't actually implemented. Um, using the custom web browser, we were able to instrument it. And we used cached web pages to simulate the updated information. So scripts would overwrite the cached web pages to, um, to provide new information. So we had 20 participants who took part in an hour-long session um, where, like I said, they had a primary task and four secondary monitoring tasks using the prototype tools. So what we found for the most part was that the task, the text clip tool, which supported fact-finding monitoring, was people seemed to be really, um, really enthusiastic about it, and people really felt that it was appropriate for the task type. So when I would, and I would, when I would ask people to say, you know, could you envision using this in your own web usage, they would come up with other fact-finding type monitoring activities that they felt that it would be useful for. Um, People seem to be a, not quite so sure about the page updated enhanced bookmark tool. And there seemed to be a little bit of, um, some people didn't necessarily appreciate the difference between the page updated and the enhanced bookmark um, monitoring tools. So participants were for, were for the most part most enthusiastic about the text clip tool. But we also found that fact finding monitoring can be a complex activity. So in addition to knowing that um, you know, a particular piece of information on the page has changed, people might, al might also want to threshold it. So not only do I want to know, you know, what the price is, but only tell me when it's reached a certain level or something to that effect. Um, some people said they would have liked to have had some sort of um, sound notification where they didn't necessarily notice the icon show up right away. With, for the page updated tool, many people, contrary to what we had thought, um, actually would have liked an indication of what had changed on the page. But it's really unclear um, whether our participants actually engaged in maintenance monitoring activities themselves, so maybe they didn't necessarily appreciate the nature of the task, which is one of the problems of running a, uh, a lab study with contrived tasks. And finally, um, the enhanced bookmarks tool, uh, many participants actually had trouble with the abstract representation, so they weren't sure exactly what the, bars, what the bars meant. But many people commented that they imagined that once they started using the tool, um, that they would sort of gain sort of a sense or a model of, you know, when the bar was this big on this particular web page, they would know, you know, how much, after a while, they would know how much had changed. Um, people thought it would be very useful for sites that don't offer RSS, and a lot of people appreciated the integration of the tool with bookmarks and commented that they used um, facilities such as Firefox Live Bookmarks, um, which integrates RSS and bookmarks as well. So just to give an overview of uh, the research contributions, so from a theoretical standpoint, um, the, inf the web information classification provides an updated uh, view of the types of high-level tasks that people engage in on the web, and also we've we've uh, provided a characterization of web information tasks and people's monitoring activities on the web. Um, we've developed recommendations for better supporting information seeking tasks on the web and also for the design and evaluation of web browser navigation mechanisms and I also presented the um, recommendations for supporting task specific web based monitoring. And finally a methodological contribution where we've develop tools and methodologies for studying user behavior on the web, which is still a very difficult, um, it's still a very difficult thing to study. It's a moving target. Um, it's very dynamic. And I think that there's still a lot of work to be done in this area in terms of developing methodologies as well as metrics for, um, for studying user behavior on the web. So just to touch a little bit on some future directions. Um, we conducted some initial work on predicting tasks based on logged implicit measures, which has shown to be promising. So if we know how people are interacting on their web browser, can we actually predict the type of task that they're engaging in? So when we did, a, when we, um, did an aggregate model, we found that our accuracy wasn't very good. But we, when we conducted individual decision tree models, we found that the, uh, 
the accuracy sort of range for individual models anywhere from sort of 40% up to 90 some percent. Um, more work is definitely needed to determine the most useful uh, prediction techniques as well as what are the best features um, that, are, that, are, that predict task type. Also, the type of navigation mechanism may suggest um, the initiation of a new task type, which may be important in delimiting task sessions. So if you observe the use of bookmarks, um, autocomplete, the use of the search toolbar, often that indicates that people are either initiating a new task or maybe changing direction within an existing task. And these findings could be useful um, within both search and recommender systems. Now, we know that there's um, fundamental differences between information seeking in desktop environments versus mobile environments, but there's still a lot of work to be done looking at these differences. So do the types of tasks that we found within desktop environment, does that necessarily port to mobile environments? Um, what types of monitoring activities do people engage in when they're using mobile devices? And also, how can we use context to improve the web experience um, for mobile users? So some of, as I said earlier, some of our participants describe their monitoring activities as a compulsion. So one of, one of the questions is, um, you know, how can we help people be more efficient with their web usage while still allowing them to use the web as you know, a, a tool that's enjoyable? Um, and if we're going to help them be more efficient, how do we actually measure efficiency? The other question is, you know, if, if we know that the type of monitoring that people do is very different and requires task-specific support, how do we do this without overwhelming people with, you know, a large number of different tools and functions? Um, and finally, our field study suggested that web-based communication accounts for a large percentage of web browser usage. Um, and so our field study was conducted in 2005, and I can only imagine that this is even more true today, um, you know, between email, blogging, instant messaging, social networking sites. So what are the current future uses of these communication mediums? Um, what are appropriate contexts for these different, um, for, for these tools, you know, versus workplace, versus um, home, versus personal, versus mobile? So there's still a lot of research to be done in that area. So just to give you a summary, so the problem that we were looking at were, was, first of all, what are the tasks in which users engage in on the web, and how do users interact with their web browsers to accomplish these tasks? The approach was to conduct three successive studies to investigate these research questions. And the main findings that came out of this research provide new insight into the tasks in which users engage in on the web, how users actually interact with their web browsers in the to complete these tasks and how web browsers could better support users during these tasks. So thank you very much and I'd be happy to take any questions. How did you track uh, tasks when users were using multiple browser windows? Um, so in that case, they had a toolbar in each window. Um, so they could have, so they could, have, when they opened a new window, <coughs> I know we went back and forth on this, and I can't, it's, it's been a couple of years, so I can't remember if the task information was repeated or if it was blanked out. I think that they had to re-enter the task information when they launched a new window. So either they would use the same information from their previous task if they were opening a new window as part of continuation, or if they were changing task, then they would enter the new task. Was there a distinction between opening a new window from the browser or opening a window from the operating system? No. There, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, um, we didn't differentiate between those two. I, I think we knew, so we knew um, if people clicked the file new button, uh, oh, yes, yeah, so we knew if people clicked the File New button or if it was simply a pop, some sort of pop-up that was launched by a web browser. We could differentiate between those two windows. Yes, because when you generate a window out of the existing browser, it inherits the page that you're viewing, whereas if you generate it from the operating system, it resolves to your home page. Yes, and we actually we were able to override that. I, to, okay. Yeah. okay, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Did you notice much in the information seeking behavior if people used features on sites very much that allowed them to kind of do the tracking? I know you said some of your solutions were to kind of create things that became a part of the application, but if it was provided on a website, did they use that to, for example, save their queries or click any yeah. of those things? Um, especially during 
So this was, it was sort of problematic um, because a lot of web pages are starting to use, you know, JavaScript and Ajax to actually provide navigation within the web page, and we actually couldn't track those activities. Um, they were completely lost to us. And there's been a little work now um, in people trying to, you know, be able to track those activities. But I hypothesize that especially during transactions, so things like banking and any types of online um, systems, that basically people stop navigating with the actual web browser and all of their navigation occurs you know, by the navigation support and utilities provided by within those online systems. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the most common navigation button that people were using on the browser? Uh, the most common... Or navigation elements. So, it, it really, so in terms of if you're talking about all navigation, whether you know you're within a task or you're initiating a new task. Um, so, clicked links obviously is the most common way. Um, the back button is is second. Now, if you start looking at as to whether people are within a task or initiating a new task, um, typed in URLs were the first way that people initiated, um, followed by bookmarks, and it sort of depended on on that. Yeah. Which was actually surprising. I was surprised that there was so much typed in URLs. So that's not autocomplete, and that's not selecting a URL. That's actually typing it from scratch. Yep. I apologize. I was late. If you already covered this, um, your demographics were they North America or were they beyond that? No, they were just um, they were university students at, in uh, in Halifax, Nova oh, Scotia. Yeah. So that, you know. For the monitoring, were they all were they all students? No. So for the monitoring, for the monitoring, the second study, the interviews, we're sort of trying to branch out a little bit and try and study sort of a wider demographic, where we had um, technical office workers, non-technical office workers, um, as well as technical and non-technical students. And we didn't control for age and gender, so we couldn't make direct comparisons between the two. But it was certainly interesting to see, you know, the differences between sort of the younger student population and the slightly older office worker. Um, where we saw a lot more of the compulsive and heavier monitoring activities by the students versus you know the office workers that tended to be a little bit more lightweight. Um, this is actually this is actually partly uh, uh, ass. This is um, sites that were like all flash driven or like CSS. Could you track any of that? Usually, what I could track. You know, there were some I couldn't track at all, and I probably didn't even see that they visited. Right. Um, so some I could see. You know, sometimes you could see the log in, the log out, but you couldn't actually see what happened. Um, so one thing that was interesting, you know, for instance, was people who used Gmail. I could see that they lo the email that they logged in or you know arrived to Gmail and left, but I couldn't see anything else. Whereas people who used um, the Dal's web-based email client, I could see every email they opened, um, which opened a new window and a new page. So. <coughs> You also you sort of have to take you know the page views, especially within transactions, with a grain of salt because depending on the type of system, you know you may launch a new page each time, you yep. may launch a new window, which was sure, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's very, certainly very different depending on the you know the email or the system. Can you go back to the table that had the um, all the different points where it was like four and two and three? Oh, I'd yeah. like to kind of understand what those weights are. Yeah. So what they were based on was basically we had done. Um, Looking at looking at significant differences. Yeah. So. Because uh, I'm, I'm not clear what the scale is. What are we looking? So this one here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what this what this says is that so pe pe um, the duration of information gathering tasks were significantly um, longer for in for information gathering than fact finding. Um, Fact finding and transactions. I don't think the difference between information gathering and browsing was significant. Okay. So one of my questions is, I feel like there's a gap because what if there's a? Do you consider fact finding or transaction when someone's going to solve a problem? They just bought a Dell computer and now they need a driver, so they're going to solve a specific problem right. that is a task. Right. Um, and I'm not clear whether you can see that in, in any of these because they're not really fact finding. They know they need a driver. Yep. Just using a scenario. Yep. No, actually, that was one of that was so a that transactional that. to you. Um, in that case, we, we sort of we did let people sort of decide how they wanted to categorize it, depending on the overall goal. So, for instance, a driver, the, the goal is really to find that file, right? Okay. That you know. So, in that case, most people would categorize that as fact finding. Okay. Yeah, and I, you know, I should add that the, you know it, this. You know, every time I give a talk, someone comes up with a task that we have this debate about where it belongs. So, you know, usually what I say is it really depends on so, you know, what is the the overall the end goal? What are you looking to walk away with at, at the end of the day? Yeah. Yes. I like your um, bookmark uh, tool, mm -hmm. but um, do people really use bookmarks? 
Surprisingly, yes. Um, you know, bookmarks get a really bad rap in the literature. Um, and you know, what we found is that people use tend to use bookmarks for pages they revisit a lot. So when you know, browsing type activities, um, and um, we also you know observed a heavy use of bookmarks within monitoring. Now, when you look at people, when you look at individual differences, so when you look at on an individual basis, we found that there we had basically four types of users: people who primarily use bookmarks people who primarily search whenever they can, people who primarily type in URLs, and then we have these odd people who just sort of do a combination of everything. Um, so it really, it really depends on, on the users. But I would definitely, I, I'm not ready to write off bookmarks yet. <laughs> yes? I have kind of a psychological question, which isn't really you know, pure data, but it's more, did people enjoy monitoring? And did they like that more than if they got alerts? Say, you know, say you can get an alert, you can you can set up an alert that tells you when a, a, a airfare goes over certain, goes under a certain price, or a you know eBay auction goes over a certain price, or you know the weather goes over a certain temperature. I mean, you can set alerts on anything, yeah. and you can set those alerts, and those alerts can can come to you via email or whatever. But my question is, do people? enjoy every hour checking on something? I think in some senses and for some people, yes. Um, you know, it's, it's an enjoyable activity instead of, you know, watching TV for half an hour, you know, you go and this is your diversion or, or whatnot. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, if people aren't using these alerts because they're missing out on the experience, um, you know, what happens when you have that serendipitous browsing that comes in? You know, you go to check the airfare, but then, you know, you ca a link catches your eye, and the next thing you know, you know, while you only intended to go, you know, check you know and spend five minutes next thing you know it's half an hour because you've been sidetracked or whatnot so yeah I do think it's an experience that people enjoy and I don't know how we try and sort of mitigate that with you know helping them in cases where they do want to try and cut down but they still want to get that that yeah, enjoyment. I'm wondering yeah. whether you know because our on our product our alerts usage is like 0.01% yeah. or something you know and you can set up an alert on anything. But a lot of people they don't want to take the time to set these things up as well so that's a huge you know that's one of the barriers to using these tools. I'm just wondering is, if they don't really want to if it's just more fun to just check the site every hour. You know, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just wondering whether alerts are just this giant waste of time. That well I think the other helps. thing that comes into play is accuracy <laughs> or trust. Do they actually believe that they will be notified? You no, know, well I haven't been notified maybe I should go check just to make sure. Yeah. yeah, so we did have things such as, you know, like accuracy and trust and reliability um, and, you know, sort of set up effort that we sort of characterize as the barriers to using these, these types of, of tools. Yeah. I have a question. Um, actually, I have a million questions. <laughs> did you track at all, how, um, like, environment? Like, if people were in their office, were they at home on the couch? Were they? No. Okay. No, we didn't track location at all. Yeah, but that would have been an interesting sort of added contextual piece to. Yeah. yeah. Something else you may not have tracked, but maybe you got a sense for is, I know in the information science research for the last 20 years, it's kind of been found that the first place people really go when they're either fact finding or info gathering, especially, are usually to a colleague or somebody else. That's right. And I wondered if you found that at all through maybe they were doing fact finding or info gathering, but what they did is they went and they IM'd a friend and said, "Hey, do you do you remember where that sale on shoes is or whatever? Or hey, what's that resource you told me about in via email? Did you find that kind of crossover at all? We really didn't explore that. Um, so we do. I don't have a lot of evidence, you know, sort of to comment on that, especially you know where. We only um, we only saw what happened within the web browser. So even if it happened in IM or any sort of external, we really didn't. Um, I didn't hear a lot of comments from people on that. Um, so, but I, re I really can't comment on that. But I definitely know that that's certainly you know a lot of times one of the the first yeah, I'm steps. I'm curious if it's changing because we yeah. you know sometimes I'll spend a half hour just looking for something that I probably could have picked something that's phone up, but I want to yeah. find it myself. So instead of you know contacting your local expert you know down the hall or whatever you go. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's changing or not. Or I don't have a sense for that unfortunately. Yeah. That's a good question though. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did you capture any data on task abandonment? About like at what level, you know, the rate of task completion will yeah. say they flip it around. No, and I don't have any sense sort of of task success um, or you know, because it w really would have been great, you know, with this data to have looked at, you know, what tasks were successful and what are not. Um, but I don't have any data on that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned HCI literature. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. So. Okay, so typically, the, so a lot of this, um, the HCI literature that I refer to has been published um, at CHI, which is... Which, what does it stand for? Oh, so HCI, oh, sorry, Human Computer Interaction. Okay, thank sorry. you, sorry. I just, oh, we have a million acronyms, so okay. I want to assume one. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. So you actually said this is all public. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there's been a lot of, you know, looking at, you know, probably five different studies that over the years have looked at, you know, back button usage and revisitation and those types of things. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. I think we'd like to thank Melanie for coming and, and sharing her research with us. Thank you very much.